Thank you for the introduction, Ruben. Hi, um, I'm Patrick, and yeah, as you already heard, I do research in video games. Mm -hmm. And today I would like you to follow me together with uh, Andre. Andre is a teenager from Sweden, and he's playing World of Warcraft, and he's really good at it. He's so good, in fact, that he, together with 30 other guys, venture into the last level of World of Warcraft, as it was at that point, to kill giant lava monsters inside a really big evil volcano, right? Um, turns out that the lava monsters, however, are not the biggest challenge that Andre and his 38, 39 companions are facing. There's a problem with the interface design of this game. And the problem is that World of Warcraft previously, as this big online title, still only really supported playing in groups up to five players. That meant that the interface was really only built to give you information about those other four dudes or um, players in your party. And now, all of a sudden, when you were playing with 40, that was a bit of a problem, because if you were, for example, leading that group, you didn't really know what was going on with the other players in your party. Were they dying? Was everything OK? You were sort of bleeding blindly. And especially if you were, for example, somebody who's keeping your, your team members alive, that was hard to do, because you never know who is about to die, whom do I need to save here. This was something that Andre, together with another uh, author, fixed. They built an add-on which is a small piece of software that runs on top of World of Warcraft, and that you can see here up in the left corner. And that exactly that, uh, it does exactly that. It gives you this information about all 40 members of that party. So now you have all this information that you need in order to play these huge levels. It was so successful and so needed in this current state of the game that this a little bit shy Swedish teenager had just built a piece of software that was used by millions of players. So it spread widely. It was the way of playing that particular game. So when I first encountered World of Warcraft, that was also around the time that I moved to Sweden. I started studying in Uppsala University, and I actually came here following my girlfriend at the time. Um, it was a little bit tricky to just move to another country like that. I didn't speak Swedish yet. I didn't have so many friends, and it was also a little bit lonely. So at that point, I also played World of Warcraft, in order to keep connected to people back at home in Germany, to speak German, and also in order to have this possibility of experiencing myself as somebody who is still social, who can be a leader in a group, or who can deal with still with, with other people and help them with problems, even though I didn't have a such big established social circles yet in Sweden. So I had a very positive first access in that case to the game. Um, in case you're wondering, coming here to follow a girl, it did turn out well, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we, are, we made uh, four, four more little gamers. Uh, <laughs> they soon will be able to beat me in any game out there, and I'm painfully aware of that, so I have to sort of savor my last moments of actually being able to win anything. Um, but yeah, when I played World of Warcraft, and that's an actual screenshot of me playing, Andre's creations or derivative stuff of those were everywhere in the game. You also see that I am really, really bad at creating sort of nice and functional interfaces. This is a mess, right? And this is actually how I played. So I'm there in the middle somewhere. There's this uh, um, a little elf person standing in front of this giant spider and absorbing the blows and shielding my, uh, my group members and so that they, they keep me alive and hopefully kill the itsy bitsy spider. Um, we will see, uh, it, uh, so, but that's how I played. But you can see similar interface features to Andre's add-on everywhere in this. So there's two of them on the left. I'm not sure why I had two. I just you know, kept them around. Another one down here, this is why it became such a mess. But it shows that these sort of interface features were just a staple of playing the game. There were so diff many different versions of them, and really everybody just, just used them because they were super useful, and they were just a part of what was World of Warcraft at that point. So the question is that, came to me then from also a scholarly perspective and when I was seeing that as, wow, this, this is really a big part of this game. So how far does this co-creation go? How much of this game is actually, in a way, made by players? And then, as the next step, and that is of course a critical social science perspective here, do these co-creators get credit for their work if they pick up so much and do so much in, in making this game? Before we follow these questions, a quick word on games research in general and games in our society. Games have become really a central part of contemporary culture. Starting out from casual games, let's see, Hansen, who in this room does play anything, any casual games, maybe Angry Birds, Candy Crush, Minecraft, 
I think that's the majority. Like most of us, especially with more casual, thank you very much, uh, most of us have some sort of connection to that. Or maybe our, your, your children or younger relatives play these games. All of these three titles are actually Nordic titles. So the Nordic countries are also very central and really well, fight or box above their weight in uh, uh, global creation of digital games. But of course, we also have the more hardcore titles, like, for example, Counter-Strike, which is a shooter game that is so central to esports, for example, that it can fill entire stadiums. And, and Swedish events like DreamHack, for example, is doing just that. Or a title like League of Legends. League of Legends is oftentimes handled as the game with the most players globally. Last year, League of Legends had 100 million monthly players. Just taste that number for a second. 100 million monthly. That's not one person counted twice. Those are individual people. <laughs> and so that, that is around the size of the population of Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Germany. Right? That's about like, that's sort of the League of Legends population. So this is how many people are playing this. And in the same way, it's esports subculture where people play competitive against each other and establish teams as filling stadiums. There's a streaming subculture where people watch these games from far away on their computers that is recently uh, discussed to be overtaking in global viewership analog sports viewing. This is, of course, a little bit difficult to measure, but it looks like that games and games culture are here to stay and are a central part of contemporary culture. Um, I also included a picture here from Tekniska Museet, the Swedish Museum for Science and Technology, that had a games exhibition a while back, and where still games are clearly recognized as a part of contemporary culture that we need to maintain, conserve, and see as something valuable in our everyday life. But let's get back to Andre and his story. So, at the, top, at the point where the creators of World of Warcraft were about to release the second version of the game, they weren't so happy with how the add-on culture had turned out because they felt that add-ons were taking over too much of the player's decisions. And they co uh, thought about removing them altogether. But what they did instead is that they invited central add-on creators, like, for example, Andre, and put them in a plane and flew them over to California to their headquarters and asked them to build an infrastructure that would make it possible for add-ons to continue existing but limit what they would be able to do in the game. And that's what they did. So for Andre, of course, this was awesome. <laughs> right? I mean, he's like this young, enthusiastic guy, and now this company who makes the game that he loves, they pay his flight to come over and help them work on it? Of course he goes, right? That's, that's great for him. And so do many of the other add-on creators. And they come and build this infrastructure after the specifications of the company and basically sit there in, in the same space where the other employees of the company work and code and build an infrastructure that just like that with that code goes into the game. So that is the maximum amount that I have ever seen of how far play, player co-creation of games can go. Right? At this point, you can't even really distinguish it anymore from other kinds of making a game. Right? The only difference between Andre as a player co-creator and company employees is that one of them is on the payroll of the company and the other isn't. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they are sitting at the same place and doing the same work. So this is sort of the most extreme case as an answer to the question of how far does player co-creation go in these games. However, this is not a lonely case. While it might be the most extreme that I managed to dig up, this player co-creation as a phenomenon is everywhere all over gaming culture. Those big titles with millions of players that I mentioned at the start, Counter-Strike, League of Legends, another one would be the game Dota, that is quite similar, they are based on player creations to start with. Their main idea, their design, that has then been taken and been further developed by for-profit companies, that comes from players who build this game, mostly as a modification, for example, Dota was first developed as a modification to Warcraft 3, and Counter-Strike was developed by two modders, as an alternative map to the game Half-Life. But these game designs that then have proliferated so much and spawned these huge esports communities, they are based on players' creativity. So what about the second question then? Do players get credit for what they do? Well, 
Sadly here, that's a little bit more sobering. When we look at Andre's story, he had to sign a non-disclosure agreement together with the other add-on contributors as well. That meant that his involvement in World of Warcraft was to be kept a secret. He did not get to put it on a CV. His name was not in the credits that rolled at the end of the game. Instead, he had to not tell anyone about it. Luckily, now that expired, so he was actually able to tell the story. But this credit was not given in this case for their contribution. So we can see that co-creation is a central aspect of contemporary game creation. However, there's also a huge imbalance in power here because the player creators who put in their work don't really have the possibility to stand up for themselves, maybe defend some sort of influence that they want to have. Instead, the most of the power belongs to the company who owns it and has control over the technological infrastructure. Meaning that player creators largely work under some sort of Damoclesian sword. They don't really know if that work that they put into that to make this game into something better, something worse, what they want to have, but what their community wants, that their, their creative participation here, if that is going to stay around, or if maybe the company decides to kill it tomorrow. That is a possibility. Right? So, also as the, to, to bring the Andre's story to an end, nowadays, he doesn't look quite as favorable on his involvement in World of Warcraft anymore. But he feels that now, as a seasoned software engineer, that what they got, what those player creators got for their involvement was two years free playing World of Warcraft. So for two years they got to play the game for free that they were involved in building. Right? That was quite a bargain for the company making the game, to get these amazing people who had millions of users of their add-ons already. Right? So it's a little bit more nuanced perspective on that than just enthusiasm. There are, of course, ways out of this. Not all of them are necessarily straightforward, but a good starting point could be to do something about this power imbalance and treat player creators as partners that get some bit more of say of what is happening with also the work that they have put into something. We have examples for this happening. And again, and I'm using most of these examples out of World of Warcraft, not because that is a game where that happens a lot or that is the worst case, not at all. This is just because this is my field site, right? This is what I knew well and that is where I collected my data. Um, this is really an issue for the entire industry or for entire games as a culture or maybe also other media. But then I also want to be fair and show positive examples from that game. And one of the most positive examples are add-ons for accessibility. This is an initiative by both the add-on player community and the company who runs the game to make modifications to the infrastructure that allow pl players with disabilities to still play the game. So this is not sold or anything. This is just made for people to need it so that they can also participate in the game. A simple example is down here, the MovePad Plus, which is an add-on that gives you virtual buttons that you can press with your mouse so that you can move your character in the game. And that simple change makes it possible for players who can only use one hand to play with their friends. Otherwise, they couldn't have done that because they would have still needed the keyboard and the mouse at the same time. So now, players like that, they can also be part of World of Warcraft and play with their friends together. And this is just one of a number of examples that are part of this add-ons for accessibility initiative. So some really amazing examples of this open partnership between the company who owns the game and the player community who co-creates it. Then, giving credit where credit is due. Put the names of players into your credit role if they participate in the game. There's no clear reason for keeping this a secret. And that would be a really big step for giving them the possibility of showing what they actually have done and being honest about who participated in making this game. But the question that maybe remains for some of you is, why does this matter? Is this about some nerds not getting their names into the credit card credits because they made a game? Now, that it has a bit more broader implications than that. This is also about our culture. We have already established that games are a central part of contemporary culture with hundreds of millions of players. This is what we are playing, what our youth is playing. This is part of our, how our youth and uh, we express ourselves. It is the culture that we maintain and keep for ourselves to understand what this moment in society looked like in our museums. So at that point, when we really have understood that games are a part of our culture, we also need to ask ourselves the question, how is this made? And is this just made by a company that controls it? Or 
maybe if we all have participated in this so much, as I've just shown you, then maybe we should recognize that. And game culture right now is this beautiful, very, culture, uh, very colored garden where so many people have contributed to build something and done different things that they showed each other and just kept open and modified each other's work. And now we are at the moment where there's a wall built around this and where it's not clear anymore that everybody can go in and modify, where it suddenly becomes look but don't touch. And we need to think about if we want to keep this possibility of changing the stories that games are telling, of modifying this culture that we have and that is such a big part of our contemporary understanding of the world and keep this possibility open. This is not something only players can do or only player creators or just an industry responsibility, but this is something where we need to think about what we want games in the future to be and where all of us need to combine our ripples in order to create some wave that can really push over the status quo and change this and keep it open, games as a possibility for expression in the future. Thank you very much.